So, welcome to another edition of the European Talk Show Dialogue. I'm really happy that all of you gathered here and I hope that you will enjoy a great show and eventually learn something as well. We are here at Beetroot offices in Kiev and um, yeah, thanks for Andreas who is hosting with his team this uh, convention and also this talk show. Uh, he will uh, be a co-host for the talk show. And first of all, we would like to talk about the Maidan movement a little bit. And the second of all, we would like to talk about the political situation in general um, in the Ukraine. And then we want to talk about the economical situation. So, and we would like to start with a nice introduction round. Um, please introduce yourself. Um, thank you, Sebastian. I'm Jim Brook. Um, this is recording, I assume. Yeah. Uh, I'm the token American in the room. I was invited because, thanks to Donald Trump, Americans know where Ukraine is this week. Uh, it's been on the front of every front page and every news site uh, for the last week. Um, some people say, you know, great publicity is better than no publicity. So now Americans are learning a little bit of geography. I uh, lived in Moscow. I'm a lifelong sort of foreign correspondent. I was overseas of the New York Times for 20 years. And uh, I lived in uh, Moscow for eight. And then after a recuperation from Moscow in Cambodia, I uh, moved here to live about four years ago. I run the Ukraine Business News. And Andreas has very kindly, uh, through Beetroot, constructed the website. It's enormously popular for you people in business. We're in uh, English, Ukrainian, Russian, and German. German. Uh, translated in Vienna. And uh, there is a huge, huge growing interest in Ukraine. So I think it's great you're all here. Uh, I was in New York talking to eight different hedge funds in a day and a half, and they say that among the emerging markets, Ukraine is the hottest for the moment, uh, starting with the new government. So I'll pass you over to Carl, who's our veteran business person here. Yeah. Yes, hello. My name is Carl Sturian, a Swedish entrepreneur living in Ukraine for 25 years, and the last 20 years also having the, the honor of being the Honorable Consul of Sweden. Um, started with agriculture and food processing in southern Ukraine and realized it's quite windy down there and, and so it switched into wind power and uh, now we, we are having the ambitious target to be becoming the biggest developer of wind power in former Soviet Union by the end of this year actually. So it has, has grown into a substantial um, renewable energy business. I spent the last half an hour introducing myself so I think <laughs> that's enough time for me. Uh, yeah, uh, we met earlier, but uh, a bit of a uh, couple of words, the spheres I, I'm trying to work in. It's the education sphere, healthcare. Um, I did some advocacy for um, changes in electoral code and uh, law enforcement agencies and judiciary. So those spheres I uh, kind of know something about. And I can also quickly introduce myself for our online viewers. Um, so I'm Andreas, the founder of uh, Beetroot, Swedish, has been in Ukraine for the last seven years and building, building up this IT company with around almost 400 people and 16 academies where we yeah, have soon educated 1% of the Ukrainian IT industry throughout Ukraine. Thank you. So the first question actually would be to Victor. Um, we want to talk about the Maidan movement and what's happened there. Your personal opinion, do you think that movement was a success and still is? The answer is not binary, success or not success. Uh, the world is not black or white, even though some people might put it that way in media or wherever. Um, it's complicated or even more, it's complex uh, because Maidan wasn't uh, like some people might say that Maidan was a starting point, but Maidan, uh, I think, would, wouldn't succeed if there, if years before that, many people were not active in different spheres and they could gather together on Maidan and have some synergy effect. So years before that, many people uh, were preparing themselves for something they didn't know what is you know the best metaphor for that would be the Dumbledore's army because uh, when uh, they changed the, the principle of the school uh, pe uh, the students start learning how to defend themselves 
without even having a threat uh, near, like near their doors. But they, they knew that something big is coming and they were preparing themselves. So a huge like, number of years before Maidan, that was the same process. And Maidan was the, the turning point when um, like th those people from different environments, different backgrounds, came together and uh, decided, like, show uh, started as a protest and um, trans like tra transferred into revolution. And uh, uh, after that, what we have uh, like five years of intense and constant changes we're living in. So success or not success, it's not the um, the definition I would I would give it to, to it. So you, you wouldn't say that you're satisfied in a way with the outcome, or it's more like a process that there is, or uh, exactly this is the process, and um, those people who are active in it. Uh, mm, defining the direction where it's going uh, for the last five years we um, moved sometimes slow sometimes faster but at least the direction was known uh, now I cannot say that direction is known and I can say that now we are in the bus where the only driver is the person who knows where it's going and all the passengers uh, Unaware so uh, who's of the, the direction. Who's who's the driver? Uh, better uh, address this question to Svetoslav. Okay. Yes. <laughs> so would you please pass the microphone? Uh, I would say that Mr. Yanukovych was the perfect president, as somebody who brought together every single side Ukrainian conversation with how idiotic his decision making was. In, during the Maidan, he was the perfect catalyst, essentially, of dislike from every section of Ukrainian society. The reality in the revolution, every time there basically was any sort of wavering or, you know, this, this lessening of the numbers there, he had done something which moved everybody back into the revolutionary square. Uh, he essentially was a uh, very useful uh, tool of history to bring Ukrainian nation together to try and change something that was essentially irritating all of us. That was Mr. Yanukovych. So, and the fact is, all of the sides in the revolution, the right, the left, the, the, you had the extreme right-wing activists, you had the LGBTQ activists joining in, all of them were united by Yanukovych and the fact that he needed to go. And the fact that he left makes this a success. Afterwards, because you know, I don't. I didn't feel that the last five years were exactly what Maidan was about. That Maidan didn't fight for this. That's why I joined Zelensky to try and move uh, sort of the situation to the dramatic transformation of every single aspect of society that I was hoping for after Maidan. That's hoping to answer. Can I uh, spice this this question a bit more? Uh, so you're both very active in the Maidan uh, movement, and uh, now you're part of. Uh, different uh, political movements and uh, Zelensky's party and, and the Golas and uh, how 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 come that you um, or, or or do you think you're actually part of a similar movement? Or could could you both comment on that because I, I think that's very interesting. Um, the goal I think is shared is common. Uh, the differences might be in uh, how to get there and um, also not only how to get there but also how it's communicated because we are on the same boat and uh, I consider myself as the like the sailor you know the lowest rank somewhere there on, on the boat and uh, I, I can I can execute commands but I need uh, to know what is it for and what comes next uh, but if we take as a country, it's a bit more complicated than the boat. Um, I'm as a citizen should um, be like consulted, consulted. Um, also, like how how to get there. So this is uh, probably the differences in approaches. Uh, we actually qu are more similar than it seems because I was hoping for that guy to run for the presidency because I had more friends in common with that guy, uh, so Mr. Vakarchuk, the singer. Uh, I was hoping for him to run, but he chickened out for the from the presidential election, basically. And I joined somebody who had the cojones, if I may say, to actually uh, exchange the laurels of fame uh, to the political reality of mudslinging. 
Uh, so the point is essentially the idea is the same in the general point, but actually they are the kind of opposition that I'm hoping to have more of in the parliament. The reality is that you know the other side is trying to essentially derail the conversation, and they are you know pointing us on time and time again to things that aren't perfect and you know very often we agree on similar points and very often we change the laws in a ways which can essentially r redress some of the points they found about those laws which are imperfect basically so my next question thank you actually would go to uh, uh, carl so um, you have been living here when the movement happened when the maidan movement happened right Yes, so as a Swede, how did you perceive that movement? Were you threatened by it? Uh, well, I, I lived through uh, both the Maidans uh, and uh, I happened to live uh, right in the epicenter uh, of where everything happened. And uh, I have to say that I never felt uh, insecure or unhappy. A lot of people left the center and moved elsewhere. A lot of people left the country. But we actually lived with our kids uh, through those revolutions right there downtown. And I have to say that the the Maidan still, of course, the, the second one, the, the recent one, became very violent at the end. And that was, I would say, probably the last 10 days, right? But throughout, the Maidan was... was uh, the mood of the Maidan was still uh, uh, inside, was kind of peaceful and uh, unfortunately it turned violent the last 10 days and we all know that and how bad it ended up but uh, i have to say that uh, we can have lengthy discussions about the, the first and the second maidan the the sad thing is that both maidans uh, took a great effort from the ukrainians and a lot of people sacrificed time and money and, and everything else and in both cases unfortunately the result wasn't very good because none of the precedent which were grown on maidan so to say didn't live up to close to the expectation of the people who actually were Maidan, not Yushchenko nor uh, nor Poroshenko. And uh, you can also say that if the first Maidan was very much around Yushchenko himself, as a, as, as a uh, he lost uh, with the rigged elections, you all know that uh, the second tour or the second part of the election, and and uh, there was a third one where he won. Uh, so that Maidan was very much about that election campaign, about him personally. The second Maidan, uh, we had a number of, of uh, strong leaders, and I would say the last one to become a leader of, of the Maidan was actually uh, President Poroshenko, because the whole, uh, if you speak of November, December, January, it wasn't very much about Poroshenko at all. Uh, and uh, there were at least four political leaders who were ahead of him on Maidan, and being the, the leaders of the movement, right? And he was non, n not one of them. And if you look at the five presidents uh, of Ukraine, the first five presidents of Ukraine, I think we have to realize that, that most of the presidents, or four out of five, were very close to expectation. The first president, uh, being a communist from the Communist Party, more or less agreed with Moscow to be appointed as the president of Ukraine, Mr. Krashuk, who I have to say probably turned out to be a stronger reformer and uh, supporter of uh, independent Ukraine than no that most probably uh, anyone could expect. Second president Kuchma, uh, also managing director of a huge military complex uh, uh, defense industry in, in uh, the city of Dnipropetrovsk, now Dnieper. Uh, nobody could expect him to be the market reformer as well, right? Because with his background. And he actually turned out to be a bigger reformer at least in, in in his first term, then then uh, I guess nobody expected, anybody expected. Uh, Yushchenko, everybody knew that he was kind of uh, weak and disorganized, and he was a very weak and disorganized president, so he lived very much up to expectation. Uh, Yanukovych, everybody knew he was a crook from Donetsk, and he came as a crook from Donetsk, and everybody knew he was going to bring all his friends, and they're going to they're going to rob the country, and he came to Kiev, and and he brought his friends, and he robbed the country, so he lived very much up to expectation as well. And then we have Poroshenko. The billionaire, you know, the billionaire speaking three languages uh, fluently, first president actually knowing a foreign language, having the money, having the education, background, had been the minister of economy, uh, minister of foreign affairs, chief of the National Security Council, head of the National Bank, no, or well, the, 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 the managing board, management board of the National Bank. Uh, so a fantastic background, having the money, having the, the education, and he, I have to say, lived up probably to 30% of expectation. 
So uh, the only precedent so far, according to my opinion, uh, that has been uh, far below expectation is only him, actually. Everybody else were close to expectation. So a follow-up question on that. What is your expectation on the current president? I'm, I'm very optimistic, uh, and I, I think we, sh we owe um, uh, the, the Mr. Zelensky, the president, uh, we owe him to be optimistic because with, with such a fantastic result and with such a fantastic trust, I think even the political opposition to him owes him to, to really give him a chance. Uh, if you, uh, you ask me the question, what, what do I expect? I actually, if you could have this ability to look into the heart of uh, President Zelensky and has his honest answer on that question, I don't think he will be able to answer it himself. Because for, this, for him this is very, very new. I think that he's really trying very, very hard. But does, is he 100% sure that he will be able to do it? I don't think so. But I know that I, I, I'm convinced that he will try extremely hard. And I'm convinced that he has, he's trying to create a great team. Unfortunately, when you create such a new team, you know that, well, if you're 70% uh, happy with the people you surround you with, well, that's good, right? But 30% most likely in most cases won't be the great persons. And a guarantee from him that all the people now joining his team will be honest. None of them will be corrupt. You know, he cannot give that, give that guarantee. But I do think he will try very, very hard. And, and uh, I think we all owe him to give him a, a fair chance to, to do the best for the country. Um, but as I said, I mean, it's not like he's done it before. And he can say, you know, I know exactly what I'm doing. And I'm just going to do it because I've done, I done it previously. And I know exactly how it has to be done, right? It's not that easy. Thank you. So, James. Um, you're from a country where there's also a president who is unexperienced in politics, the same as I would say to Zelensky. So they're both new to the field where they're working in. How do you perceive Zelensky? Well, um, first of all, my apologies for Trump <laughs> bad-mouthing Angela Merkel and um, goading uh, Zelensky into agreeing to that, which is a major faux pas. Um, this is the tape that came out, and uh, Zelensky agreed with Trump that Germany was not contributing to Ukraine, which is totally false. Um, you know, Trump is a disaster. Uh, we're starting the impeachment. He's just proved to be very erratic, very unreliable. Um, sometimes it can be good to break things, but uh, he doesn't have a strategy as far as I can tell. And we don't know if the impeachment will, will work or not. Um, I, I think Zelensky's of a different category. Uh, you know, the, the, I didn't like that face up between Zelensky and Trump in the U. No, no, but it, it, the picture, I'm talking about the picture on Wednesday, you know, uh, Zelensky looked very worried, <laughs> and, and Trump looked like he was just off on his roll again, and uh, and grabbed something and just blah 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 about it. Uh, facts be damned. Uh, so Trump is not a, but then Boris Johnson is not a good example <laughs> for a beginner leader. Uh, we, we've had some pretty terrible examples in the last uh, year or so. Um, I, I'm hopeful about Zelensky. Unfortunately, that that tape came out. It didn't make him look good. Um, he's got behind him the oligarch who paid for his entire media campaign, who is very ambitious and basically wants to scratch money through the system. Um, he probably won't get his bank back, but he will do things. He'll try to get hold of various government agencies. And that's a great thing about Ukraine is there is a free press and there's a very strong civil society. So when Kolomoisky tries to you know, shut down the discount airline to help his airline or tries to get hold of Ukr or NAFTA, this will be denounced, and uh, not just in the RADA, but in the press and in the civil society. So um, you're, you're looking here, and once again, I think it's great you're all here, at a very uh, tolerant and diverse multi-party democracy. We did not know who the president would be back in March. Just no, you know, unlike our little neighbor to the east, we knew exactly who was going to win the election. We did not know who would replace. We didn't know if Poroshenko would be replaced. You know, um, so it is a multi-party democracy, no question about it, and it's surprisingly tolerant. Uh, I last time I was here, Andreas, I, I took a cab out of here, and if you walk around, there's a, a mosque up at the top of the hill, and it's a very pretty mosque. And I just sort of casually commented to the cab driver, "Oh, that's a very pretty mosque, very pretty building." 
and frankly, a lot of New York and European cab drivers say, no, it's not a pretty building, it's a mosque, you know. <laughs> but, you know, the guy said, yeah, that is a very nice building. You know, it's, it's very graceful, and it's on the top of the hill. Uh, there was a Pew Charitable Trust did a survey two years ago. Um, how would you, about Central Europeans, you know, Poland, Hungary, Czech, how would you like to have a Jewish person as your neighbor? And to me, having grown up partly in New York, that's kind of like, that's not even a question. This is a reality. But, uh, you know, and it was surprising. 30% of Poles said, no, I don't really want that. The most tolerant response was in Ukraine, and it was like 6%. So of these six Eastern European countries, this was the most tolerant on that score. So, uh, and we have Zelensky, the only Jewish president outside of Israel. And that kind of pops the balloon of the Kremlin propaganda machine about the Nazi fascist Ukrainians that, you know, this summer had, you know, a Jewish president with a Jewish prime minister backed by a Jewish oligarch. I mean, you know, uh, it just doesn't, that doesn't work. And you will find walking around, and I urge you all to go to Khrushchev this, this evening, there's going to be a light show on the main drag here. Um, very tolerant people, very uh, relaxed people. Um, so I don't know if I'm getting to the point. Uh, with Zelensky, I, as I think as Carl said, he's got a lot of learning to do, uh, but he's got a good team. And if you look beyond some of the initial stumbles, the it's a really revolutionary uh, package of laws that are going through the RADA. There will be Europe's largest farm market, period. There is no other country in Europe that has 42 million hectares that will be entering a market during the 2020s, starting a year from now. Uh, they will privatize. It will be the biggest state company fire sale seen in Eastern Europe in probably a generation. They have 3,500 state companies, of which half don't even work. So they're going to be privatizing, starting the farm market, private locomotion in terms of uh, uh, locomotives on the railroad tracks. There are a lot of areas of public-private partnerships. So. The key, and for me as a journalist, because I talk to you know, European and UK and American business people about the opportunities here, is to keep your eye on the ball and look at these amazing opportunities that are going to be opening up, uh, which will indeed boost the growth rate. I am firmly convinced that this will be the fastest growing economy in Eastern Europe in the 2020s. Thank you. So. Um Let's briefly talk about the general political situation here that you kind of need to build on the economy then later on. So, um, Victor, let's start with you again. How would you describe the current situation, political situation? Would you say, I'm going with binary again, uh, stable or not stable? <laughs> um, if you follow the news during the last two weeks, how would you assess it? Stable or not stable? <laughs> That's too binary for me. <laughs> Yeah, um, <laughs> uh, well, I don't know, since the results of the presidential elections, I'm constantly cautious and constantly, you know, alarmed that something will happen. And uh, it makes me, like, a bit, uh, I know, stressed because, like, to trying to follow different aspects like in economy, in judiciary, like law enforcement and international poli like foreign poli uh, politics because uh, you don't know where we're gonna um, miss the hook, the punch, uh, you know, and uh, um, as I, uh, we spoke earlier today, I ran for the parliament in my single constituency not because uh, it's fun, uh, but uh, I spent last year working in the Ministry of Health and all our um, uh, like results and successes, I felt that, that uh, it's uh, under the threat. So my attempt to run to the parliament was to uh, defend the achievements, at least in healthcare and maybe in some other spheres and uh, bring more, some, uh, more thoughtful and more evidence-based policy making into the uh, into the parliament so as of end of presidential elections i'm always cautious and um, this is this is the new reality and especially after the news of uh, uh, the published uh, published notes after uh, like different uh, tones of uh, both presidents uh, i'm not sure or like if uh, 
we took the right position in this geopolitical game in this uh, uh, chess chess board so and my stress is not going away anytime soon I think all right well I'll be binary I am very confident, I'm very bullish, exactly because I go into that room every single faction meeting, a lot of people have lots of stress and questions, they interact with the president, and they get their questions answered, and then we vote together in the parliament to get those amazing reforms, as Mr. Brook so nicely put it, done. Uh, to the US situation, what is happening at the moment? If Trump gets impeached, Democrats will be happy with Ukraine being the, the smoking gun that impeaches him. Trump is very happy with the conversation. That was the purpose of the conversation. It wasn't to be um, published by national media and for the world to love it. It's to essentially build the bridge with the Trump administration. The previous administration was so uh, keen at destroying with their involvement in the previous elections. The reality being that I see only reasons for optimism and confidence because all the hullabaloo in the media basically is diminished by the reality of what's happening in the parliament, cabinet ministers, and the president's office every single day. Yeah, so um, the, um, the situation that everybody is voting in favor of uh, the drafts that are proposed um, is actually the reason why I'm s so cautious, because the, uh, there is no discussion. And um, the origin of those drafts is unknown, and the uh, interest they, uh, behind is unknown, and when there is no discussion, there no cannot be a balance or compromise of different stakeholders. So when there is uh, you know, like this legislative tank or uh, moving forward, uh, crushing every single uh, different opinion that stands on its way, uh, it's dangerous. So this is the reason to be uh, a bit less optimistic, maybe cautiously optimistic. May I add? Uh, so I disagree with that. First, there is discussion happening in the committee. Discussion in the parliament is show. It's a show essentially where all the factions are trying to make uh, their position clear for their TV channels to present that they've stated their opinion there. And discussion in the parliament essentially can be overrun by a parliamentary procedure, I which is that. And thankfully, Ukrainian people have given us this tank. We didn't just make it. We got it from the Ukrainian people to be able to get these reforms done quickly. And whenever I speak to the people, people are asking, why are we doing this so slowly? So for them, this is a slow operation, actually. And I'm very happy that in the committee, committees beforehand, essentially, the conversations do happen. I'm very happy about Golos coming to oh, most of the committee meetings, actually participating, contributing to that discussion. So whoever wants to participate and discuss, does. Whoever doesn't, just speaks in the parliament for the show. Add just something very quickly um, about confidence. You know, we had a very bad two weeks with the Zelensky Trump uh, just dominating the news cycle the entire week. Before that, it was the picture of Zelensky with the oligarch, uh, Holomoysky, who kind of came out of the closet and showed himself in public. Um, it was really a bad two weeks of news. And then on Tuesday, they had the weekly auction of uh, Grivna government bonds. And this is where locals and foreigners can buy bonds. Uh, five-year bonds, foreigners, after all this news, bid $600 million worth, a record amount of they wanted to purchase. And you buy a five-year bond, it's not a very liquid market here. You're kind of getting married to Ukraine for five years. You, know? <laughs> you can trade these things, but not that easily and not that quickly. So, uh, and the bids were, the whole thing was oversubscribed, so maybe about $200 million of the bids are actually filled. So. We had, you know, CNN hour by hour raising alarm bells about Trump and Zelensky. We had Holomoisky coming out and casting a shadow of the government. But the investors looked at the fundamentals, including, as Svetozov said, the, the, the RADA, the uh, parliamentary calendar of bills, and they voted with their feet and put $600 million on the table for, for five-year bonds. Uh, I, I'm, I'm not sure all uh, of the people in the room know who is Kolomoisky. Who is Kolomoisky and what is his relation to the current government? <laughs> sure. <laughs> no, I'm always a fan of giving the opposition the first say. 
Um, Kolomoisky is one of the Ukrainian oligarchs, and uh, his reality is that he basically has done plenty of schemes in the Ukrainian government and created his own uh, indispensability for various Ukrainian institutions. His relation with Zelensky is basically the one of the most talked about questions of the entire campaign. The reality being right now very simply is that Kolomoisky and Zelensky more than Zelensky and Kolomoisky. And uh, looking at the fact that they had a meeting is actually a very keen evidence of a change in relationship. So unlike the previous president who basically has done his meetings in secret, have uh, had these investigative journalists showing how secret cars or various oligarchs were coming to him at night, this was done out and about and publicly presented afterwards to Ukraine. Uh, the reality being that we don't want to destroy or demolish the oligarchs, we want to lessen their share. How to do that is exactly with what James said, essentially uh, diminishing their position by international investment. So their stake in the Ukrainian economy is lessened. And the fact is that, that, that we see a point in the future where the share that Mr. Kolomoisky and other oligarchs will have is much less and not as fundamental to Ukraine's story. Yeah, what Svetoslav said, uh, the new president is much better in communication. This is why they post the picture, but they didn't post the notes or at least uh, some content of the meeting. Um, well, the mm, signing the picture on Facebook, it's not they, the... They, they uh, that everybody asked what the meeting was about, and they did say the meeting was about essentially Colin Moise and contributing the money for various projects. And we have to believe it, because... <laughs> well, we can look at the very... We can look at the very basic fact that Zelensky now has a support which is essentially uh, very hard to describe in Ukraine's history and that he doesn't need Kolomoisky's support to maintain that. Mm. He basically is in control of the situation, having the parliament which his party controls, having cabinet ministers that he proposed and essentially was appointed by his parliament. So the reality is that I don't see any of the threats which is described by the opposition who is so keen to find any single chink in the armor and to jump on it. There is none. Yeah, the uh, popular support doesn't mean it's good. Many people drink alcohol, even though they know the effect of the alcohol. But the uh, uh, Kolomoisky presence in Ukrainian politics at the moment shows that he is not afraid of, of anything because, like, for last couple of years after he served as the um regional uh the head of the regional administration he lived in exile because he had conflicts with previous uh um government i'm not saying they were um like um r uh, rightful or, or or something but the thing that he is not afraid uh, like of being prosecuted or something and it, as it was pointed he made his fortune ba uh, like based on um state-owned enterprises and different schemes. So there should be some reasons why he's back, and there are many uh, members of the parliament in the party you pr mm, represent that have some tie ties with Kolomoisky. So all these signals, it's not looking for something to pinch you, it's just facts. And uh, please don't start with alternative facts. Yeah, well, uh, just just quickly to educate our visiting friends, uh, an oligarch, Soviet Union fell in 1991. It was an entirely state-run economy. The oligarchs were people, they're very good at acquiring, grabbing uh, state-owned properties, mines and factories. I was the Bloomberg bureau chief in Moscow in, I don't know, 2007, and my reporter, one of my best reporter, went to work for Merrill Lynch, and he said, you know, Jim, these oligarchs, they're very good at grabbing stuff. They're not good at creating. They're not Bill Gates's. They're, they're not Steve Jobs's. They're good at grabbing stuff. So uh, Holomoisky is of that generation. He's very good at grabbing stuff. The former head of the National Bank said she met with him 40 to 50 times, and every time he physically threatened her. <laughs> this is a, a charming guy. Um, so he's good at grabbing. You know, in the U.S., we have a long history of gangsters, you know, whether Italian or Jewish or whatever. We, we have had gangsters in the past. Um, and if you look at his companies, okay, he owns the national flag airline, Ukrainian International Airlines, so you may have flown in on that. It lost $100 million last year. He's not a great businessman. He runs a ski area in the Carpathians called Bukovel. 
I lived in the American Rockies, so I'm a skiing snob, and it is basically a 1970s B-minus ski area. Do not go to Bukovel, even if you want to save money. It's just cheap and crummy and full of billboards and, and cheap real estate. Uh, he owns two airports. They're the worst performing airports in the country, Ivana Frankis and Denis Pro. Now, he's got the new president to pay to rebuild the runways of each airport, which is needed. You know, these are old concrete block, bang, 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 runways. But, you know, Kolomoisky's administration, these two airports said, no, no, Turkish Airlines can't fly into this airport. SkyUp, the discount airline, can't fly in. So this is the oligarch, that generation, they uh, basically made their money by, for lack of better words, stealing and by controlling, creating monopolies and manipulating the government administration through bribes and through paying off judges, this sort of thing. So they're, they're all over the place in Russia. I mean, Russia's run by oligarchs, and there's several here, and people have their eyes wide open. And so Kolomoisky will try his games, but fortunately the press and civil society will be denouncing this. So it's very interesting to watch next five years how it plays out. Also, to add to that, to understand Ukraine, you must look at what the fact is oligarchic pluralism. Ukrainian history is about essentially Ukrainian economy being essentially cut up in various pieces by various people who basically have to battle it out politically. So they invested in their political parties, their own media channels, and in that discussion, which actually became political, as well as business discussion, basically pluralism is created and the fact of forces of democracy come about to basically seize the conversation in the end. In reality, what I meant by popularity isn't that just Zelensky's populist or whatever he makes is good. I was saying that when oligarchs discussing something with a man who has this kind of support, he is in a better negotiating position because they have to listen to him and they have no chips to put on the table, meaning that they have no, say, MPs they, want, they can leverage in the parliament that they control that he needs to get something done. He basically is in a better negotiating position. He can force them to negotiate or to settle in various questions, like the airport questions, for example. Carl, you want to comment on this big discussion? Well, I, I do think that, that uh, oligarch is, is just one simple world, right? And uh, those oligarchs are very different animals. So it's not really to just call them oligarchs and put them all in one box. It's, it's not really, really the, the, the right way to do it. Uh, for example, if, if you look at Kalamoyski, his absolutely biggest asset that he's fighting about right now was the big, he c it was created by him. It wasn't a state asset taken over by him, it was created by him. It was Privat Bank being uh, at that time uh, still the biggest bank in Ukraine. And the bank was created by him and his team from scratch. Later on, they became the biggest bank and, and they were th by far the biggest savings bank from Ukrainian uh, people. And then it turned out that 95% of, of the loans from the bank went into his enterprises. And, and here we have a problem, right? And then, and then uh, who is Kalamoyski? I know the guy fairly well. And I can tell you that, that he's a very opportunistic businessman. And if the National Bank allows him to give 95% of the money from the bank to himself, he would do that. And then you ask yourself the question, where is the National Bank and whose responsibility is it? Is it the responsibility of the IMF and the National Bank to actually tell him that this can be done and this cannot be done? Or is it his, his responsibility? He is a businessman. He took the opportunity and he made the money. It's the National reg Regulator who has to tell him what is allowed and what is not allowed. Uh, so the here and the reason and they we kind of did by taking back take nationalizing the bank right now the, the second question comes and why we have this very very uh, smelly conflict between him and and the, the national bank because uh, the IMF which who bailed Ukraine out after the after the Maidan uh, in the end of the day about five billion dollars went into the into private bank for recapitalizing the bank and most of that money was stolen right and now the question comes who stole the money and we all know that, that every single step of the National Bank at that moment, uh, every single step of the private bank at that moment was controlled by the National Bank because they were following every single little thing they were doing, right? So was this uh, out, half out of this 150 billion given us $5 billion, half of it is most likely stolen? Could it have been done without the knowledge of the president and the head of the National Bank? My answer is no. And here comes the conflict. And this is why, uh, as I said, that uh, Valeria, who's now sitting in London, right, and she was threatened by, by Kalamoski. Well, uh, if you go back to, to the way he sees it, 
actually having very sim lot of similarities to the to the crooks in the United States 70 80 years ago right in his world we stole together and then you turned it back to me and, and nationalized the bank and as two crooks this is not okay so you know the president the head of the national bank and me and me and me Kalamoyski we stole that money together and you know then you turn it back to me and you, you take the bank away from me you know not okay so in his uh, uh, little bit criminal thinking world. This was was uh, not the way it's done by the book book of codex, uh, if you put it that way. So um, I do I do think that he has created some enterprises. Uh, other, other money he has just made skimming out of the state budget. Uh, then we have well a much bigger oligarch who I think has cost Ukraine much more money, being uh, Mr. Akhmetov. And uh, Mr. Akhmetov is vice versa. All his enterprises have more or less been taken over by him. Uh, from the government in very 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 stinky privatizations not even privatizations just you know putting the companies against the wall put them into bankruptcy taking over the assets and he is has has taken all his enterprises but he's very very good in managing his enterprises so his companies are very very professionally managed you know they have IFRS IFRS accounting they have PwC make, making their accounts for the last you know 20 years they raise their money through JP Morgan, uh, you know, they have their bonds placed in London and so on and so on. So the company is very well managed, but the original the enterprise is, is, is all taken over from state assets. So, come back to the question, oligarchs are very different animals and uh, these two examples are showing completely two different profiles. Thank you. So, let's talk about more a bit of the opportunities of the economic situation in um, in the Ukraine, because uh, to be quite honest, I have the feeling that I mean, we're Ukraine is a country in war, right? People dying every day, and I have the feeling that um, most of the people struggling with their own lives and can't even think that much about that they are living in a country with a, with war, where people dying. So I would say. And it's just personal opinion, and I would like you to comment on that. I would say to raise the standard of living would be good for peace, yeah, providing process within the country. So my question actually to you is how do you raise the standard of living in the Ukraine? What measures would be necessary to do that? Are oligarchs an opportunity or not? I mean, yeah, so... Yeah, well, I'm, I'm Mr. Ukraine Business News, so I'll take the first answer. Uh, yeah, the war is important, but the war uh, ties up about 5% of the national territory. If you forget about Crimea, which basically, unfortunately, is lost for a generation, uh, it's only the occupied half of two regions out of 24 of Donetsk and Luhansk. So you're talking about maximum 5% of the national territory, maybe 5% of the national population. I've been down there. It, it takes like 14 hours by train to get down to the front line. Um, there's a lot more to Ukraine, like 95%. This is the largest country in, in Europe. Um, France is technically bigger if you count French Guiana, but <laughs> let's not count French Guiana. Um, so biggest country, comparative advantage is obviously uh, farming, agriculture. About 40% of uh, exports are uh, food. Uh, Ukraine is Europe's largest food exporter. Um, I was talking to a British economist yesterday. Ukraine, uh, UK, Britain is Europe's largest food importer. So if Brexit happens, you will you could have a UK Ukraine uh, free trade pact that would be marrying the world's the Europe's largest food exporter with Europe's largest food importer. So agriculture, a huge area. Uh, the area that Andreas is working in IT uh, is world class. I think it's the number one uh, destination for British outsourcing is uh, Ukraine. Uh, they're very ambitious plans to double the number of software engineers, which is where Beetroot Academy is, is crucial. And what Andreas is doing is crucial because every IT per company I run into, they're going so fast they can't fill the jobs, fill the seats. They're recruiting from Belarus, from Kazakhstan, from um, uh, Moldova, so Russian speakers. Uh, so IT uh, is, uh, and the Israelis are very busy here. They're outsourcing a lot here. Apparently, there are 50 R&D, so they're moving up the food chain from simply outsourcing to R&D. Um, 
so I think there is a lot of, um, I think the cheap labor option is kind of exhausting itself because with the visa-free travel to the EU, there's been a lot of um, what I call brawn drain as against brain drain. Uh, I'm sure that no one here pays income taxes of 5%. <laughs> if you work in IT in Ukraine, your income tax is 5% which, you know, you go to Krakow, all of a sudden you're going to be paying 30%. So the brain drain I don't see as a huge problem. Now, Andreas is sucking in his breath for his retort, <laughs> but uh, it is the brawn drain. The tractor drivers will just go over to Poland and work for the summer for three times as much money. And, and that is raising salaries, and that's good. Um, just quickly, we've got the world's largest, Europe's largest farm market that will start up a year from now. You're going to have the privatizations. Uh, you have a very business-friendly uh, – great thing about Ukraine is people here, they're great borrowers. So if the EU has a intellectual property law, they'll just take it off the shelf, translate to Ukrainian. Now, Victor would say it would be a, a perfunctory debate at the RADA, but they will debate it, <laughs> maybe in committee, as much as I would like to say. But they're great borrowers. So what you Europeans and the EU have done, they'll just take off the shelf, translate to Ukrainian, and implement and that is making this country very EU standard. In the next five years, it will be EU standard. That makes it a lot easier for you folks to work here. Uh, the exports to Europe is very interesting. In the last five years, it's completely diametrically changed. Number one destination used to be Russia. That's flipped. Number one destination is now EU. In terms of countries, uh, number one destination trading partner is now China, which is interesting. But um, there's been a real changing places between Russia and EU. I'll sign off there. And pass. Yes, uh, in terms of the political from one book that I personally liked uh, very much is uh, Ukraine, What Went Wrong and How to Fix It, uh, which is describing, uh, by Anders Osland, uh, describing many of the reforms that was done in other Eastern European countries and that were not done in uh, Ukraine at the right time. Yeah. Carl, you want to continue? Well, I, d I do think that Ukraine, uh, th this question is extremely important because Ukraine doesn't have a, a choice. Uh, now Ukraine has been living from artificial financials for the last five years, uh, being supported by IMF, United States and European Union. Uh, that will not continue forever. We can already today see that the, the French and the German uh, leadership and the British leadership says that yes, of course, we support Ukraine, but we have to, we have to regain a good relationship with Russia. It's also very crucial for Europe. Uh, well, and from from our Ukrainian turf, we see that of course the all of Europe is is only behind Ukraine and is ready to to do anything against Russia to support Ukraine. This is not true, you know. The, the real stuff that's happening is is telling us a different thing. And and if you look at the most evident is that European Union was was punishing Russia by uh, imposing sanctions on everything that Europe never bought from Russia. So if you walked around in, in uh, all European capitals and you had got 100 bucks to find a Russian product, you would not be able to find a Russian product except in Russian dedicated shops, right? But if you went to, in s we are some Swedes here, if you went to Encore or Lens or Hemsköp, and you have to find a Russian product, impossible, right? So European Union uh, uh, introduced sanctions on everything we never bought except the only thing we ever bought was gas. So we put sanctions on everything except gas. Very logical, right? And we continue building the pipeline. So, uh, yes, on Facebook it looks like uh, we, we put a lot of sanctions on Russia, but in reality we didn't put any sanctions at all. And Putin was just extremely happy because uh, as a result of this he could impose the same sanctions on European Union. And today he has turned a lot of central European farmers against European Union because they said we used to export 100% of our products to Russia. Now we cannot sell to Russia anymore, so now we're against European Union. And this, unfortunately, has created a political mood both in Hungary, uh, Czech Republic, uh, partly Poland. And uh, so, so the result, unfortunately, has been vice versa. Why I'm saying all this is that, that Ukraine doesn't have a choice. Ukraine has to become... Uh, economically independent in the very, very, very near future because this artificial supporting of the economy for five years will not continue forever because sooner or later the European politicians are going to say that yes, this, you know, this is a nice trip but somehow you have to kind of fix your own, fix your own country and, and manage it in, 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 in a better way. And if Ukraine is not successful then unfortunately we have the little neighbor in the north, not so little neighbor, but with the little leader at least uh, and that little leader is just sitting and waiting it out 
and just waiting it out and uh, a little bit making life difficult for European Union and for Ukraine and just hoping that Ukraine will not be economically successful just to pick up the country when, when it's poor enough. And what do Ukraine, Ukraine need to do to be economically successful in the coming five years? Well, uh, as I said, I live here for 25 years and, and the message I'm now working, uh, my dear uh, boss number two just joined <laughs> our Swedish ambassador and I, I think I'm working with ambassador number six or seven uh, and the message I've been participating in, in all those meetings, right? And the message from European Union and the United States has always been the same. Question number one, fight corruption. Because, because, uh, the, and you don't have to discuss the rest. Because if you, if you, if you actually get rid of the corruption, everything else would fix itself. So, uh, and at the, as the problem is to 90% related to corruption, the, those other 10% we can discuss it for hours, but it doesn't really matter. You know, we have to get rid of the corruption. And I do think, think that the, the current government is doing a lot uh, to do that. Unfortunately, and the, the previous government. I would say in a lot of areas of Ukraine actually made the country more corrupt than even Yanukovych. Uh, why I'm saying that is because Yanukovych had, had a few extremely corrupt directions of action uh, that was uh, completely under his personal control or one of his two close oligarchs, in this case being the Firtash or, or the Natashmetov, but it was very, very uh, under, under very strict control who is stealing what and how much, right? Uh, the, the, the under the Parashenk, uh, under uh, the, the previous government and the previous president, unfortunately, we had more of a chaos, uh, and we we instead of actually have a very creating a very strong general prosecutor's office, we created all kind of government agencies that were supposed to fight corruption, make, making it actually nobody responsibility. If you have six government agencies who are supposed to fight corruption. Then you have the old Russian saying that the collective form of responsibility is usually one form of no responsibility. So in the end of the day, nobody was actually responsible for actually doing something about corruption. So we had SAP, we had uh, Geber, we had uh, Nabu, we had uh, anti corruption prosecutor, we had the general prosecutor fighting with his own deputy being chief of anti corruption prosecutor, and so on and so on and so on. So, so corruption actually became worse in the last five years. Um, Carl here is being very modest. He actually is the catch-up king of Ukraine. Uh, Carl uh, invested heavily with Swedish capital into processing tomatoes into tomato paste, which we call ketchup. 90% uh, of the agriculture exports of Ukraine, I would guesstimate, are commodities. Just quickly, what do you see about the process, processed food perspectives of moving up the value chain? Actually, I, I'm very often having this question, and uh, most most people don't agree with me because I don't think that that's necessary at the moment. Because, as you very correctly mentioned, Ukraine has uh, 42 million hectares of agriculture land, uh, 35 million hectares of plowed land, and I do think that that not to make life more complicated than it has to be, to just cultivate very effectively on 35 million hectares would make Ukraine. The, uh, even if you go commodities, right, would be Ucr make Ukraine the largest f uh, commodity, agricultural commodity exporter in the world. And with uh, the population, that, that is a sensitive topic, how big the population is in Ukraine. You know, don't mention anymore, more, but okay, let's say it's somewhere between 30 and 40 million. Uh, but to feed 30 to 40 million people, uh, if you are the largest agriculture exporter in the world, is absolutely possible. Then later on, to go into processing, yes, that's a great idea. United States is exporting a little bit over 100 million tons of grains per year. And Germany is exporting about 50, mil 50 million tons of grains per year. Ukraine is slightly above that, or has been above that twice in the last 30 years, uh, in 2012 and I think last year. And, but is Ukraine could potentially, actually, uh, by just farming the available land in an efficient way, export more grain than the United States. And as you correctly mentioned, uh, Ukraine is in, in a very favorable position. We know that your president, uh, President Trump, uh, loves uh, China and, and the trade war with China, right? And the same with European Union. We don't speak so loudly about it, but you know we have a problem with the trade balance between Europe and, and China. And here Ukraine is extremely fortunate because Ukraine is one of the few countries in the world having quite a healthy trade balance with China. And as you correctly mentioned, China has become the, 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 the largest trading partner of Ukraine. If we continue growing agriculture and if we could actually double the, the agriculture export, even if it's a commodity, right, we would have a, we would have a trade uh, um, 
plus with, with China, so yeah, surplus, uh, and that will be make Ukraine a very, very unique country, actually selling more to China than we're actually buying from China. And could Ukraine macroeconomically and also as as uh, domestic more domestic economy, uh, could Ukraine be healthy from just that? I think so, because because what goes into agriculture is start from from seeds, uh, crop protection, fertilizers, machinery, uh, service sector, and, and everything related to it, right? Roads, infrastructure, railroad, elevators, and, and ports, and, 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 you know, yes, you can deploy so much people just, b just by being successful doing that, actually. And then everything else is on top of it, the IT sector on top of it, processing yeah, on top of it. One quick thing, thanks to Donald Trump, Ukraine now sells more corn to China than the U.S. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So. So I, I, I do I do see that that uh, it's uh, I usually say that if you if I had to become the prime minister and draw up an, an economical model of the country they're going to manage the absolutely easiest country in Europe to draw up a healthy economical model for is Ukraine. I mean I don't really nothing against a lot of other European Union countries, but there, there are a number of European Union countries. I mean Greece, Portugal. If I was the prime minister, do I really see? A clear picture how I can have a healthy state budget in a very very easy and near future. No, I don't see that right in Ukraine, where unfortunately teachers and doctors make peanuts, right? And and retired people also get very very low pensions. So the cost part of the Ukrainian state budget is very very small. The income part is very easy to fix, just by you know things we just mentioned here. You know, IT sector great, uh, uh, ketchup and tomato processing great, right? But just by having the the commodity being fixed could actually hold up the macroeconomical country very, very easily. I just want to s completely support everything that was said. We are completely free market oriented. That was our agenda from the beginning, something that actually uh, completely showed to me that Zelensky is my guy in this election. It's the fact that his first program in February had the words privatization, deregulation, and most importantly, land market, which was essentially what everybody told you should be, but he was the only one bold enough to say it right away in his program. And this week, we'll be most likely voting on this, and we'll most likely getting it done. And um, very hopeful because I'm hearing lots of billions from many people uh, that will be directed to our country to try and support and build up income in Ukraine and that's the way to actually destroy our disparity as far as poverty is concerned. Getting as many jobs in Ukraine as possible and land market is certainly the way to do this. Um, yes, yeah, so a couple of quick reflections on what was said before going to economics. Uh, First, uh, you, Sebastian, you said like people live in it war, and uh, but not everyone feels it. Uh, like because I do some workshops and trainings, and um, quite often travel to Donetsk and Luhansk region. Uh, even there, people get used to uh, the constant shelling or or shooting, and uh, like we don't need to talk about Kiev because here in Kiev you don't you don't feel that. that uh, 500 kilometers away from here, uh, the war is happening, right? Um, so we adapted, and uh, I don't know. It's it. I know, it's something to uh, to work on uh, late later, and you know this the threshold of pain or uh, or something because we don't feel that war is happening now. This is the first thing. The second thing that. Uh, during Poroshenko, uh, we got more corruption. I would say it became more visible uh, because if we talk about like volume or amount of corruption during Yanukovych, uh, the pie was shared only in closed circle, and we didn't know about stuff. Now, because we have all the register, transparent registers, uh, we have the public procurement, we have uh, those the um, institutions that you mentioned. All, all of it become uh, opened. So if you talk about uh, how to fight corruption, the world is fighting between two approaches, is punishment for corruption and prevention. So we created institutions for each of the, of the approaches. The thing is, it's not everything is working properly, but at least we know the enemy we're fighting with. So those uh, corrupted schemes became more transparent and this is another task to solve how to beat those schemes and I, the thing that I just disagree that volume of corruption increased during the last five years and um, 
e economy, how to increase the standard of living. Um, uh, my question: Should the state, should the state increase in it? Like because uh, I, I have a picture that like state should give everyone I don't know uh, a package of uh, good living standard or something, but. Um, it, it, the state is the rule maker, and we expect from the rule maker, from the state, be fair and just. Uh, today, earlier, I showed the distribution of wealth. So this, the gap uh, for the richest, for the oligarchy and like uh, all their friends, uh, the rules are not applied to them. So the state should be the rule maker, and those ra uh, rules should be fair and just, and. Uh, if we're talking about economic reforms, I would say the judiciary comes first because we can accelerate uh, all the privatization and farm market, but if there is no referee to, to tell uh, what was bought or privatized in a proper way or fair, or there were some schemes or whatever, uh, we're gonna lose twice more if there is no such a referee. So for me, this is the question what should be first, the, the, where should we put all efforts first on the economy? Because as you mentioned earlier, oligarchs and some particular kinds of oligarchs are grabbing stuff. And if we let them to the field where they can grab everything with no referee, with no sanctions, um, we might be in not in that situation that we desire to be. This is my second point. And um, the third point is um, coming to what we expect from the government to give us something, but um, mostly here you come in from entrepreneurial environments. Um, you, entrepreneurs, they know uh, not only how to use opportunities, but how to create opportunities. And I think this is the key uh, for reforms to, uh, in Ukraine, not to learn people how we like y use things and giving them stuff, but teach them, educate them how to create opportunities and use them. Because the farm market, the privatization, it's an opportunity. But most of Ukrainians will not know how to use it and will not have capital to use it. Thank you very much. Looking at the time, uh, one hour is full now. And uh, I hope that we could give our viewers and the uh, other participants who are here um, a better insight of the Ukraine now and I hope that you now have many more questions regarding everything that has been said so far here and I hope that you will pick up books and conversations and uh, start to talk and start to read about the Ukraine and deal with that country a bit more than you maybe do now and so thank you very much to everybody to our guests to the audience thank you, thank you.